The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Acted like this is like likewise open. We didn't show up here by default or just looking for a place to plug in laptop. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, it's always kind of a little bit of a toss up. Um, I mean, how interested people will be at this. Um, it's, it's interesting, so to me it is. And uh, so what I kind of wanted to do, um, I'm a developer by, by trade. Um, currently I'm director of engineering at Likewise. I'll give you a little bit more background on, on, on myself. But um, essentially what we've developed at Likewise is a Microsoft compatible distributed, distributed computing platform. Um, and it's much broader than just you know, being able to log in using your Active Directory credentials uh, you know, on, a, on a Mac box or on a Linux box or whatever. I mean, it, it's actually a development platform. So we've got um, you know, complete uh, you know, Microsoft IDL compatible DCRPC runtime. There's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with it. But um, so it's primarily going to be kind of a, a little bit of a development talk. Um, so I, I guess I'm kind of curious in terms of, of background. So how many people are more on the administration side? All right, how many people are more on the development side? Okay. So what kind of apps do you guys work in? What, at what level of the stack? Systems, web, middle? Uh, systems, sweet. We should get t-shirts printed up, man. It's like a dying breed, you know? Um, all right, so these are the plans for the day. I want to go over a little bit of um, the Likewise Ecology, just in terms of uh, you know, what is Likewise Open, the project, versus Likewise Open, the product. Um, go over sort of an architectural overview of the platform itself, individual components, things like that. I'm going to give a demo of Likewise Open just in terms of the end user experience of it. Um, at some point, you know, I can look at the SIF server. Um, I guess, are you guys more interested in um, file storage or in identity? Identity? Identity is kind of the building block. Um, so, all right, that's fine. We'll focus a lot on that. I want to look at some of the integrated authentication APIs um, in terms of, because it is a platform, um, we don't have what you would consider to be sort of a formalized software development kit in terms of documentation, but we do um, stress very heavily public uh, interfaces, um, public header files, and client-side libraries. Um, we've consolidated a lot on GSS, so the integrated security model essentially we provide a, an NTLM SSP mechanism for the SPNAGO stack and the MIT Curve 5 code. And, uh, and so essentially just by calling GSS accept security context, then you get NTLM, you get Curve 5. I mean, it just kind of all works. It's really great because the authentication code in our file server stack is about 20 lines of code. I mean, it's really, really tiny. Um, and then obviously my other goal for today is not to do something that's going to end me up on YouTube and, you know, haunt me for the rest of my life. The unspoken thing is don't suck and be funny, right? So we'll see how well I do. You guys can rate me on that. I'm notorious for bad jokes um, just to keep you awake. So if I see anybody coming with one of those little red spots on their forehead because they leaned over a little bit too long, I'll let you know. So um, my background's in academic CS. I've been in the industry about 11 plus years. Um, I've done a lot of systems administration uh, and been involved in the systems administration community. Um, you know, my master's work was around compilers. Uh, I work at the systems layer. Um, I worked on Samba for about uh, 11 years, so my apologies um, for any pain that I caused you guys. Um, I, I left Samba uh, in 2009 actually because um, it was at that point that likewise it was actually um, building a new SIF stack and it seemed to be why work on two different SIP servers. Um, anyways, so I've done lots of different things. I like to run. I like to play music, piano, and guitar. Started off on drums. Have a drum set in my office at the house in Alabama. Um, a little bit of, if you haven't heard of Likewise, Likewise, it, it, the, the open source efforts or the, the project that we do is often termed open core. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a, a misnomer. We have a single source code base and we've released a large portion of that, the core identity framework, the core platform, and, and the SIF stack under GPL, LGPL licenses. Um, so free to use it. I, I, to be honest, at this point, I would have released it under BSD if I could, but we needed to protect the IP and make it open and, and you know, available for people to use. So Likewise itself is based out of Bellevue, Washington. Um, I myself am based out of a small town in Alabama near Auburn. Um, so I actually telecommute, work there. Um, 
I manage about, uh, at this point, uh, about 10 folks on our, on our engineering team. Uh, just to give you another idea, it, when I talk about Likewise as a platform, um, it, it really is a platform. This is not something specific to Linux. This is something that's been integrated in all types of devices. It scales up and it scales down. Um, so we've, we've run inside hypervisors. Um, we're actually baked into Zen. We're baked into uh, VMware ESXi 4.1. Um, desktops and servers, obviously, we both have, you know, we, we have an open product, we have a commercial product. Um, network devices, uh, network accelerators, storage gateways, um, printers, you know, all kinds of stuff. So it is a very portable, it is a very portable platform. Um, we actually build and compile, uh, you know, across HPUX, AIX, Solaris, um, FreeBSD, Mac, Linux, um, you know, all Itanium, PowerPC, and Intel variants. Um, I'd rather just focus on Intel, it's much easier, but anyways. All right, so a little bit of background. Um, first of all, the Git repository is located up on this URL at the top of the screen. Um, to avoid some confusion, there's something called Likewise Open the Project, which is basically just an umbrella project that Likewise releases, um, and I kind of sort of manage and, and, and own. It's an umbrella project for anything that has to do with interoperability that we can push out open source, okay? Um, there's something called Likewise Open the Product, which is actually this, you know, thing that gets you a GUI on your desktop that says join into Active Directory, and we actually release packages on that. Then there's something called Likewise Identity Services, which is essentially just the identity piece, and then there's Likewise Storage Services, which is the, the file server stack. These are basically vertical offerings on our horizontal platform. Really, that's all it is. The likewise, the likewise platform, everything that's in the Git repository encompasses pretty much everything on the screen, okay? So it, it's, it's kind of all there. Um, we did recently add uh, an announcement for NFSV3 support in our storage stack. That's actually commercial only, so ignore that. And, and to be completely transparent, um, I'm gonna try, except for when necessary, to distinguish between different components to not talk about commercial stuff at all. So everything that we talk about is part of the, the open core platform, okay? Um, okay, so I wanna talk about architecture. I wanna talk about what's available, what the individual pieces are. One of the things I'm very proud of is the, the sort of the very modular architecture that we have. Um, it's easy to explain, it's easy to talk about, it's easy to point to. Um, it's, it's, I think, great from a development point of view because we, we do focus on um, process isolation, we do focus on you know, well-defined interfaces. I'm not gonna claim that we're perfect. It's software, God knows it's not, but... Um, so I wanna focus on essentially the, the architecture that we have, okay, for platform. The IO manager, the security authority, and everything down is all included in the Likewise Open Platform, okay? These bottom level components, these are what I'm gonna call sort of core foundational pieces. Right, it's the security authority, which is what we call LSAS, and the IO manager, which is LWIO, which are really the, the core heart of the functionality of the system. Things like um, the IPC communication handles all the marshalling and unmarshalling of requests going across Unix domain sockets between processes in the system itself. It's a sort of lightweight serialization protocol, okay? Um, things like the domain, like the, uh, the name resolver, is a single service that allows any process running on the system to be able to locate the appropriate domain controller to talk to. It handles all the knowledge of AD site topology. It handles all the knowledge of, um, you know, things like, uh, you know, looking up and finding the most responsive and closest domain controller. It also handles things like writing out configuration files for integration with third-party apps, right, to, to make things like um, open SSH that's got GSS API authentication enabled um, it, it handles writing out the configuration files or the, the curb5.conf for configuring the preferred DC location so that when SSHD wants to, um, you know, obtain, well, I'm trying to think of a good example. Uh, it's more of an SSH client. If you, so if you're logging in, you want to get a service ticket to be able to access some remote Kerberized application, then it's actually got the, the DCs listed in order as determined by the resolver into what the most preferable one to talk to is. So it's a central place to be able to get that. The service manager is sort of a meta um, service management and monitoring framework. Um, DCRPC, I talked about our DCRPC runtime. This is middle compatible, so it is a good way to be able to do 
you know, to port applications from Windows over to Linux, just rebuild the, uh, the, the, the it'll stubs and then sort of relink your application, you're pretty good to go. We have a, a central configuration store, we call it the registry, you can think of it as a trusted service with a SQLite backend, okay, I'll show you some examples of that. Um, everything's multi-threaded, heavily threaded, uh, thread safe. Um, common security model, basically across everything. I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the talk. Um, and then um, services are isolated. Uh, they communicate across this well-defined um, IPC bus. We'll talk more about that as well and kind of go into to each individual detail, right? How many people have never seen or sort of read through the code in the Likewise platform at all? Okay, all right. So um, what I'll do is, uh, I mean, first, just to give sort of a level set for everybody, give you a quick demo, a quick demo of Likewise Open um, on Ubuntu 11.04. It's included in the main repositories. Um, I'll show you, show you from the end user's perspective, and then we can talk about actually what's, what's the plumbing under the sink, right? Um, so I'll go ahead and swap back down here. I've got a couple of VMs running. Let me get rid of a couple of these windows that aren't in use. So I've got um, a Windows 2008 DC running in one VM, and then I've got an Ubuntu 11.04 desktop in another. So the packages, there's a likewise open package, there's a likewise open GUI package, um, and I'll just launch the uh, sort of graphical join my machine to this domain. There's some options that you can tweak here. I mean, as a systems administrator, I mean, you may want to, you know, force people to, you know, preface their username when they log in with the name of the domain or some variant thereof, or you can just kind of assume it. Um, I'm kind of a purist, so I never, I never use that. Um, so, name of my domain, razor.likewiseopen.org. And the name of my computer name is, is Snappy, and I'm just going to say join this to the domain. And don't you love this progress bar because it's not done anything, and then all of a sudden it's done. It's like no progress at all. Um, so at this point, we're joined into Active Directory. If I go back and, and look in um, over here in Administrative Tools in ADUC, we'll get a computer object that shows up. Probably should have brought this up already. Computers, they're snappy. They're snappy. Look at the properties. Lo and behold, operating system says, likewise open 6.0.0, flu, flu, flu. Version number is 11.04 from Ubuntu. Um, so, I mean, there you go. There's the computer object in AD. Um, it's also gone through and All right, can you guys, is that font big enough? You okay? Uh, so if you've ever done any Kerberos configuration, um, wow, this is a really big file. Uh, it's set up a lot of things. Some of this is for smart card integration, which is actually part of the, the enterprise product, but it sets up some of the PK init utilities and requirements that are there. The default realm set up to be the name of the Active Directory domain that I, I joined. Sets up the default encryption types, the preferred encryption types to be those specific um, inks that work with, uh, with Active Directory. It's also done, um, at least in the end user product, or at least in the Likewise Open, the um, desktop integration product, is also set up a name service switch module to integrate in with the uh, NSS libraries. So for example, if I wanted to say, you know, show me the information about a user called G. Carter, it's gonna go through and it'll look up um, and pull all the information about that user from Active Directory and then, uh, and then give you those listings of groups after it maps those 80 groups back into uh, to Unix identities. Um, let me do this. Let me clear the cache. Playing. Uh, maybe cash. Oops. All right, 
so cache has been emptied. So the next thing I'll do is just log out and then just, just to kind of finish the demo, I'll log back in to show you that there's no smoke in the errors. Um, so in this case, I'll just log in as gcarter at Razor. Razor being the short name of the Active Directory domain. Pop in my password and there we go. So once we log in, the authentication at this particular spot integrates in with GDM going through a, a PAM interface. And then as part of that login, um, it'll actually go through and initialize the user's Kerberos ticket cache as well. So um, if I can find a terminal. All right and I look at what my, uh, my Kerberos ticket cache is, it's already given me a TGT and a couple of service tickets to, uh, to access the local host to assume to ensure that the TGT wasn't actually spoofed by some rogue KDC. And um, if I wanted to, for example, access, uh, you know, I'll just, it, I'd spend so much time in the file server, it's probably easy for me to just kind of, you know, deal with it like this. So if I just want to connect to a server, um, I've got a, my laptop, actually the base operating system is, uh, is running the likewise storage stack, so I'll just connect to CF laptop, the share will be public, and um, I don't even think I have to put in a username. I should just use my Kerberos creds, and there we go, we've already committed, we've already connected to it. K-List now shows that it's, uh, you know, everything's gone through Curve 5 authentication, it's giving me a service ticket. So at this point, anything that requires Kerberos authentication on this desktop can use that ticket cache. So that can be single sign-on through Mozilla, um, that can be open SSH, that can be, um, you know, SASL-based uh, operations, uh, whether it's for things like SMTP or whether it's for um, IMAP access, you know, things like that. The application integration is always kind of the hard part, but this gives you essentially all the plumbing that's necessary to, uh, all the plumbing that's kind of necessary to do that, okay? So that's sort of the quick and dirty demo to show you it's not vaporware. It actually does work. Um, it's out there. That was actually pulled from the Likewise Open um, package that's included in, in Ubuntu 11.04. You can pull the source code and you can build the same bits. Um, what's actually in the tree is much newer. Okay. So we got several branches showing up in the Git repository. Master is the truck uh, trunk branch. They'll probably beat you up and take your take your lunch money. So be careful. Okay. All right. So how do we do it? Um, so the, the platform components is essentially composed of several different services. Now, in this case, if we're just talking about the identity stack, ignore the server service, right? But everything else, everything else actually holds true. And in our, our previous generation, I would say that everything that's in a light blue box is actually a separate daemon running on the server itself. Um, we've moved to a, an architecture that allows us to port something called service containers. Um, and if I, if I can get a listing here, oh, come on, where'd you go? Ah, there you are. All right, so these are actually the Right, so these are actually the, the likewise services that are running on, on this particular box. And you'll see that each one shows itself as LW container. So a service container allowed us to take something that used to run as an individual process, define it as a service library, and essentially our service manager forks a copy of itself and then can load one or more of those individual service instances or those service libraries into a single container. So this is gonna allow us to scale down. So previously, you would have to run multiple daemons, even if you were running on a small footprint device, you'd have to run multiple daemons, um, you know, LSAS, LWIO, um, NetLogon, and LWRegd, and the service manager. You would have to run at least five daemons on a small footprint environment. And you could tune the stack size down per threads to about, uh, I think 32K is as low as we've, we've trimmed it down. So you can trim the memory usage down, but you still have you know, each individual process that has its own thread pool and things like that. Service containers are gonna allow us to essentially collapse all of those individual services into a single daemon itself. So we're doing what we call likewise embedded, which would allow us to, con to take this whole stack and collapse it down into back into a single process. To share common resources like a single thread pool, things like that. Um, and mainly it's for small footprint, device, small footprint devices like uh, network devices, um, routers, 
um, you know, potentially handhelds. We can, you know, come up with a market for that. So, uh, so anyway, so everything that shows up in a blue box is an individual. I'm going to call it a service rather than a daemon at this point. So the likewise security authority, this is the heart of the system. And, and I, should, I should be clear because there's sometimes confusion about this. None of this is Samba code, okay? If you look at it, it's very obvious it's not, okay? Because it's a completely different coding style. It's a threaded architecture. I worked on Samba for 11 years. This is entirely a clean room implementation. It's not the same code base. It's not taken from the same code base. It doesn't even resemble the same code base, okay? So for better or worse, just so that everybody knows. Um, the Likewise Security Authority is the equivalent of Winbind in Samba or LSAS.exe on Windows. This is the heart of the authentication system. So everything that has to do with exposing users from one of these providers to Unix applications or to other uh, services running within the Likewise stack are handled by the Likewise Security Authority. Now, internally, there's a provider routing layer, and each one of these providers is actually a shared library that gets loaded. So there's an Active Directory provider that handles the join into Active Directory, maintaining things like the machine account membership, updating the key tab file on machine password changes, maintaining affinity to the last server that we can, uh, you know, successfully connected to. Um, so this is kind of the heart of that. Not only does the Active Directory provider maintain the, uh, the uh, account information for a join to an individual Active Directory domain, but it can, ask you, it can, it can support multi-tenancy at this point. So it can join multiple disparate Active Directory domains. And the common use case would be a network routing device or proxy authentication device that sits in a building. There's five floors on the building. Each one's a different company. None of them interact with each other at all, but yet the, the maintenance or the lease agreement you know, says that all of your traffic has to go out through this device. This device has a VIP or you know, some physical leg on each and one of those individual networks. Each one of those interfaces represents a computer object that's joined into that specific individual Active Directory domain. So it can support this concept of multi-tenancy in the authentication side of the stack. We haven't finished the multi-tenancy work in the file server yet, but, um, but Active Directory provider took what was previously global state, collapsed it down into an individual um, per domain context, and then that's essentially what, uh, it supports all the same things like machine password changes individually for each one of those domains, um, mapping users back and forth, uh, from a, a Windows security identifier to a Unix ID. This is also the layer that does things. So currently in the, the identi identity stack, the default mode of operation is to hash that SID, which is a 128-bit number, down to a 31-bit number. So we take some domain SID, we hash it to a 31-bit UID. Okay, so there's known problems with that. You get over 500,000 users, um, or you have a high turnover rate in your account, you'll start to get duplicate UIDs. So this is actually what we call policy. And that it works for most people, but if anybody wants to replace it, it's very easy. There's uh, three or four different functions that can be stubbed out and essentially replaced here. Um, the changes to the stack that actually support, um, so in the enterprise product, we support pulling information out of AD. But in the open stack, and don't tell anybody I told you this, the size of the patch to actually implement support for RFC 2307 attributes um, and just read those directly out of AD and reuse the, um, the Microsoft uh, Identity Management for Unix plugin is like, I don't know, 20, 30 lines. It's really minimal. So all the plumbing's already there, it's just not shipped by default. It also has a local provider, which is a full user and group database, it supports group nesting, same concept that you have with a Windows box when you join it into a domain. So when you join a likewise installation into Active Directory, there's a built-in administrators group. Uh, the domain administrators are added into that built-in administrators group, so you can use that for doing um, authorization checks based on, on group membership. LWIOD is the, uh, is the core IO path. It's both client and server. Um, and the, uh, the client aspect is actually used for supporting the named pipe transport layer for our DCRPC runtime. And this is essentially the equivalent of a kernel IO system ported into user space. All of this is in user space, okay? The resolver, I've talked a little bit about that. Um, NetLogOnD is the name of the service. That handles, um, you know, all the CLDAP traffic, the DNS SRV record lookups, uh, you know, AD site topology. All the implementation and knowledge of that is built into that service. The registry is our central configuration service. Um, it is exposed and has an information that's sort of a sub-key, hierarchy, key value pair database. It's back-ended by SQLite. 
Um, we also have an in-memory back end for that uh, for lighter, smaller, scaled-down environments. Okay. Um, server service is really just for interoperability with um, Windows boxes and the storage stack. Right. All right. So all the uh, this yellow line, IPC communication between all of these services. So for example, if um, if the likewise security authority needs to find a domain controller, it makes a request of the resolver library using a well-defined public interface um, and asks the resolver library to go find a DC for it for this particular domain. All of that is done over this IPC message bus, right? So the command line utilities, and I'll show you this a little bit as we go on. Um, so LW, whoops. Org. Okay, so all of this information that's printed back, so all of our command line utilities are thin wrappers around underlying APIs that do the same thing or some combination of that. So you don't have to fork an exec to, to call utilities to be able to do this. There's a, an LWNet get DC name API call and all this is doing is making that API call. This is essentially mirroring the structure that's returned back. So in this case, you see information like um, the forest name that you're actually talking to for this specific DC, maybe this is not the root of a forest, maybe this is actually a child domain, so you'd actually get the real forest name here. Um, things AD site topology, the short name of the DC itself, short name of the, uh, of the domain that you're talking to, um, the IPv4 address. So currently I should say this about IPv6. Um, we will likely have complete support for um, IPv6 only domains later this year. So I think right now we've got the dev support scheduled for like, um, uh, I'm going to say July and August, but it may be September. So right now we, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's just going to be grunt work really. I mean, we're in pretty good shape for it, but right now it's IPv, IPv4 only, okay? Um, but the way that this works is there is a header. Um, let's see, I'll make that a little smaller. Logon includes wnets.h. My hard disk is kind of complaining with some with a couple of VMs running. DC name. I got the wrong header. I might. I've got it in one of the slides. I may have the wrong header up at the moment, so we'll come back to it. But but essentially, the model is like um, when you look at, at this architecture of LSAS, it's, it's sort of expanded out a little bit more. This Unix domain socket interface is done over this LW message component. And the LW message component allows you to essentially serialize structures, make um, local uh, RPC calls across a Unix domain socket. So with every service, right, this is all the GPL code. Um, with every service, there is a associated client library that is LGPL and a header. So in order to communicate with the Likewise Security Authority, there's an LSA client library that your, your application would link with, and there's an LSA.h header file that you would include in your source code, and then that would give you the ability to make any of these public um, calls into LSAS. And like I say, the, the, the model is the client libraries are released under LGPL and the core daemon is actually under GPL. And this is all V2, not V3. Okay. Um, so for LSAS itself, I've already talked a little bit about the provider. Um, this IPC dispatch layer is something very common that you'll see for handling the incoming requests on the, off the Unix domain sockets. On the other side, you'll see that the PAM and the NSS layers are actually just applications written on top of the client API. And this client API has things like, um, you know, uh, LSA find security object, um, LSA authenticate user EX, which supports the raw uh, non um, SSPI version of NTLM authentication, NTLM 1 and 2. We also support constrained delegation. So if you build the likewise stack on a device, 
um, and you want to allow that particular device to be able to obtain Kerberos tickets on behalf of other users, then you can, we support um, essentially services for user, which is a version of constrained delegation within Active Directory. Um, this comes up a lot when people want to do like encrypted MAPI acceleration and you know things like that. Um, I mentioned that we also support a GSS NTL and mechanism um, for an SPNAGO stack. So I'll show you an example of a web server that's about 700 lines of code. The authentication part is about 10 lines of code. It just does a GSS accept security context, but it allows you to do single sign-on from IE on Windows directly to some application running on Linux. A good example sort of sample code. This one's actually only negotiating NTLM, but you get kind of the, you get kind of the idea. Um, in terms, of, uh, in terms of external code that we've, that we've pulled into our tree, um, we have about 1.5 million lines of C. We've pulled in um, MIT Kerberos 1.7 and backported the uh, constrained delegation support from 1.8. But any local patches that we have, we work with the, the Curb5 guys to, to push back up. We actually have some former MIT devs. So we, we actually don't like to carry local patches. We just have a version that's sandboxed and we ship because we build across a lot of platforms and you just, you know, they don't all have what you need. Um, open LDAP, uh, client libraries only. Um, we had some local modifications for those to support GSS SPNAGO, SASL authentication. We've since moved to write a GSS SPNAGO um, plugin for Cyrus SASL. So, you know, the actual amount of external components that we have um, that have local patches is really minimal. Um, so it's, you know, pretty much all of, those, all of those external patches are either just for convenience or they're just to ensure stability on a, on a single version itself, okay? Um, ignore the likewise cells. That's part of likewise enterprise. Um, I'm not gonna go into it. Unprovision mode, I talked about that's this hashing scheme so you can just sort of drop it into an AD environment. It does support the full gamut of Windows trust scenarios, so one-way trust, farce, transitive trusts, um, you know, external trust, things like that. Um, it supports offline password caching for interactive logons only. So it doesn't allow you to cache NTLM logons, but if somebody logs on on the desktop, then we'll um, securely store a version based on the clear six of that user's password. So for laptop scenarios, you can carry them around and still log in when you're disconnected to the network. Um, Automated machine password, user ticket refreshes, site affinity, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I mean, this is really the heart of the authentication in the system itself. And it's kind of one of the reasons why we were able to do the Sys file server development so rapidly is because we built on top of this uh, existing platform. Now, the storage services um, is, is key to the identity stack for one reason. And, and the reason is, is because in order to implement real interoperability with DCRPC, you have to support a name pipe transport, okay? Um, we inherited or we picked up Novell release, so Luke Howard wrote XAD, which turned into Unix domain services for Windows when Novell bought it. Novell re-released some of the original modified OSF DCRPC libraries that Luke had worked on originally. We picked that up and did a lot of other cleanup, and in fact, um, Apple has now picked up those same libraries back from us and they have re-released their changes back out on dcrpc.org. So this thing gets kind of a, a lot of life, but this part's a, a fairly old code base. But in order to implement the name pipe transport, we, so our, our IO manager is essentially, um, it's a, I'm gonna call them drivers even though it's in user space, they're shared libraries that have well-defined entry points. So the client redirector is actually a, a, an rdr.so file on disk that gets loaded by the IO manager and it is a client file system. So if you think about it, think about the VFS layer on Linux, when you mount a remote NFS file system, as a user, as an application, you just go to open a file. You don't have to worry about where it's actually stored. What happens is at the VFS layer, that's actually handed off to the NFS client. That NFS client then sends that and translates that to a request to some remote server to do the open itself. Same concept here. In this case, the client redirector is an SMB, SMB2 client redirector, and our DCRPC runtime does uh, an, IO, an, an, an NT create file to actually open up the name pipe on some remote server. So that's why it's core to the identity stack itself. Again, you see the common Unix domain socket layer, which is, is this LW message component. Same type, you've got a, an LW client 
Let me finish this thought and I'll grab you. You have an LWIO client library with a set of APIs that you can link to, and there's other drivers um, available for this, right? And I'll get to those in a couple of slides. Yeah. No, no, no. This is, and in, in let's, let's be clear, it's SMB and SMB2 is the name of the protocol. Samba is another implementation of that protocol, okay? And this is all, again, clean room code. The client redirector is fully threaded. There's actually no threads within the IO manager. They, the thread pooling mechanism has to be implemented by each individual driver. Um, it's very similar. Um, if you've ever done any, uh, any file system development or filter driver development uh, on a Windows NT kernel, um, or even probably VMS, a lot of this actually translates from VMS. We have, internally, we use a, an ERP model, an IO request packet model, so there's about 20 ERPs. Um, you know, read file, write file, close file, lock file, query information file, query directory, change, things like that. Um, and so all of, all the only things that this driver has to implement are these particular ERPs. And then these drivers can actually communicate with each other over this core API. So for example, we'll get to talk about the SMB server driver itself, and the SMB server driver receives information coming in off the wire, and then calls into the file system driver to actually access the bits on, on disk itself. So in order for customization, we find, I mean, a lot of people tend to um, integrate in that file system port with their, we deal with a lot of clustered storage vendors, so they integrate that file system driver with their clustered file system very tightly, but they never worry about the SMB protocol engine because it's a completely separate driver itself, right? Um, uh, yeah, modular, blah, blah, blah. I just like this slide, so I have to put it in. I spend a lot of time on it. It's a nice object model, okay? Um, it's a completely asynchronous interface, um, and I won't go into that too much, but for example, one driver calling into another can specify an asynchronous control block that has a callback mechanism, and uh, inside the, the second driver can basically take that ERP, it can return status pending, add it on an internal work queue, go do whatever it wants, and when it gets done, it completes that ERP, and the IO manager will invoke the callback for the original calling process, or the, the original calling driver within that process, but they're just function pointers that get, that get passed around. ERP cancellation as well. Um, file rundown semantics on handle closed. So, for example, if you have um, you know a file object that gets closed, but it has some pending reads on that that haven't completed, the IO manager will internally cancel all of those outstanding ERPs. The driver has to release all the resources. So, it's pretty it's pretty elegant, but you know it's I think you've probably run into it before. It's just a list of of ERPs. I'll give these slides to Jeremy or, or somebody at the conference and post it. Or if you want them directly, I'll be happy to email them out too. So. Um, so, uh, storage services, so to actually take the IO manager, make it into a file server, you add in um, like a file system driver, name pipe file system uh, driver, you add in the SMB protocol engine, which is what we call the serve driver, um, pretty broad support, SMB, SMB2, um, supports Linux, Mac, OSX clients. Um, we're also working on um, clustering support, and like I mentioned, we've added in some additional protocol drivers for things other than SMB, so we've got NFS coming. Right, NFS3 now, um, you know, almost done, and then NFS4 and 4.1 and PNFS later. Okay? So that's kind of that's the heart of it itself, right? So um, what are the other pieces in the platform? So the other piece is, yeah, I got way too many slides. How am I? I'm 16. I'm halfway done. What time have I got to shut up? Like 20 minutes? Okay. Okay. Um, so we have a service manager. I've talked a little bit about this. This originally was for us just a portable way of dealing with the hassle of init scripts across all this you know, wide variety of platforms. Since then, we've added in um, things like service containers. We've done some watchdog, facili uh, watchdog facilities within the um, service manager so that if a process dies, it can automatically restart it up to a threshold. Um, and you know, it can do some really kind of fun things like, for example, uh, here. Because it internally can manage uh, its own service dependencies, what I'll do is I'll just stop the registry. And when I stop the registry, oops, see this is what I get from working off trunk. Actually, let me go from a clean state. So, pay no attention to the man behind the mirrors. All right, okay. So if I wanted to start up the, if I wanted to start up the service service, which is the, um, uh, the net share enum file shares kind of thing. I can say start up the server service 
and it'll go through and start up all of the services that serve service actually depends on. So it actually maintains this directed graph um, of information, so at least on the client side, that you can build up this, um, this service dependency. And I think I'll give you an example. Yeah, that's like the dependency graph. Um, you know, you can see that in order to start up something like server management, it requires that the security authority is started up as well as the namepipe file system. Um, for the security authority to start up, it has to start up several other things. So it kind of builds this directed graph in memory and, and can help handle a lot of that stuff. So we ship with a couple of init scripts. Um, this is just an example of that public API, right? So there's an lwsm.h, there's enumerate services, start service, acquire handle, everything's handle based. Um, and then you link with the LWSM library. And this is the kind of information that you can get, right? So this information is about the LSAS service, its dependencies upon these other configured services, um, what service group or what service container it needs to be assigned to. And then, you know, like I said, when it starts up, it'll, it'll handle those dependencies. So the question is, where is that information actually stored? And it's actually stored in the registry. So let me just give you a quick quick shock and awe. So, um, so this is actually the likewise registry. This LW red shell is communicating with a service. That service has a, a persistent backend store written in SQLite stored on the file system, but it implements essentially a, a trusted service model where it performs the authentication based on the um, so peer creds of the user coming in over the Unix domain socket creates the access token, does the RTL access check against the security descriptor for a particular key. So for example, if I try to read the machine password as a non-root user, it's going to look at the security descriptor associated with a particular key and it's going to say, no, sorry, you, you can't actually see that. But this is the central configuration store for the entire, um, entire likewise suite. So all of those services, each one has an individual key. If I wanted to look at LWIO, you know, it'd have other other information associated with that. And we, we could drill down through this and give a lot of other examples, but I think, I think you kind of get the idea. The nice thing about this, again, just, just like the LWNet get DC name was a thin wrapper around an API call, this registry shell is just a wrapper around things like open key, enum, sub keys, you know, query values, set value, things like that. Um, of anything, I think this is the most horrific interface. Um, and the reason, it's a little bit historic. Our past VP of engineering was very, very strict on, we, we want to maintain API compatibility to make it easier to port from Windows over to Linux, but the registry API does some really god awful things. So um, we've changed it a little bit. And in fact, we've created this ability to do um, what we call copy on write semantics. Right, so these copy on write semantics allow us to assign some attributes with a given value, right? So that the problem that we had is somebody sets a value in the registry and now you upgrade, but you can't tell if the explicit value defined in the registry was the default from the previous installation or something that that administrator explicitly set. So we created these attributes that allow us to define sort of a default attribute and make it self-documenting. We can add doc strings and some sort of range or hints things that could be parsed by a management application to say, oh, would you like to set the machine password lifespan? Well, here you go, the default is set to this. Oh, the doc description that I get back says that this is the machine password expiration lifetime in seconds, and then these are valid integer ranges. So it gives you some ability to be able to um, have some of the advantages of things like XML without the overhead of having XML. So. Um, and it's kind of nice because you can define a default value and then you can just override all the defaults, but if anybody has an explicit value set, then that actually gets maintained uh, across upgrades. And then this is, we're actually backing up the security descriptor associated with an individual key and we're writing it out in this standard um, software, or this security descriptor definition language. It's SDDL, it's kind of a common, common Microsoftism. Um, the domain resolver, I've talked about this a little bit. Uh, I guess let me show you at least the generated files on disk. So for, for third-party app integration, if I go to var lib likewise, there is this um, curb 5 affinity file that gets written out. And what it does is it writes out a manual list of KDCs that have been located um, that have been determined to match the site of the local client machine. So you can set the environment variable, the curb 5 config environment variable, 
to actually maintain um, multiple configuration files. And then essentially the client application will get the, the aggregate sum of all those. So you can have all of your settings that you tweak in etsycurve5.conf and you can set um, you know, something like um, curve5 config equals etsycurve5.conf. Well, I can't type, but you get the idea. It is curve5 affinity, right? So you could set it to be that kind of value. And your, your third-party Kerberos applications would then sort of, you know, get the aggregate sum of all those settings, which means that all of a sudden things like the OpenSSH client are now aware of AD sites. So if it's going to go try to get a service ticket to access a remote host, it's going to go to a DC that's actually configured within the local site of, um, uh, of the host itself. I mean, we've had environments where, I mean, this has been a big, big deal. And it's in some environments, I mean, this is kind of one of the reasons why people were were willing to go with this was because of this, this third-party app integration. Um, some API examples, again, I mentioned the get DC name, right? So you'll see a lot of, of very sort of Hungarian notation. It's, again, historical. We're moving kind of away from it, but we, you will see a standard set of type defs in terms of structure definitions as well as 32-bit, um, 64-bit values, unsigned, things like that. Uh, so it's kind of, it's a common coding convention throughout the, uh, throughout the entire code base, uh, at least of all of our code, okay? Um, okay, so now we kind of, we kind of that's the, the gist of the platform itself. So I think the, uh, and I'm doing pretty good on time at this point, I think I got about five slides less than about 15 minutes. So I want to talk about the common security model. How many people have ever programmed something to use GSS API? Okay, sorry, so here's the number one rule you have to remember. Any RFC that has generic or simple in the title is not, okay? So remember that. So generic, um, the GSS API, Generic Security Services Application Programming Interface. Um, and the way the GSS API works is that it's, it's an interface that you can code against, right? So the client will do, in an init security context, it'll send a serialized version of that security buffer over the wire to the server, the server takes that, hands it off to an accept security context, and then it's, it's up to whatever mechanism is implementing that GSS API interface that's negotiated through, through OIDs, basically. It's set by OIDs um, to do the right thing. So your application doesn't have to know anything. So if you wanted to change what mechanism you were using for authentication, you wouldn't have to rebuild or rewrite your application. You just have to you know, link in another GSS API library. Now, um, that was okay, except for you only got one mechanism and the client in the server had no way to determine which one they actually wanted. So they had to know beforehand. So then we have this thing called Simple Protected Negotiation of GSS API, SPNego. And Microsoft is the one that really sort of brought it to bear in Windows 2000. SPNego sends a list of OIDs and says, these are the ones that I know, or actually, um, the client sends, the server has to send back, there can be multiple steps in the negotiation, but the, the server essentially sends back and says, these are, these are the OIDs of the authentication mechanisms that I know, which ones do you support? And then the client picks one and sends a security input token, um, you know, an input buffer with that OID representing that particular security mechanism that it wants to support. And you see this, this is how Windows clients support um, Kerberos and NTLM authentication depending upon whatever the environment actually supports. And you see this in, in single sign-on in like web applications where there's an HTTP negotiate protocol that actually supports SPNego. Then you also have this thing called SASL, right, which shows up in LDAP RFCs and it's simple authentication and security layer. And SASL has a GSS API mechanism, right? So you can negotiate that you want to use GSS API, but you still have to already know which GSS API mechanism you want to use. So Microsoft came up with GSS SPNego which means that you have SASL to negotiate which authentication mechanism that you want to use, and you select SPNego to negotiate which GSS API mechanism you want to use. So it's like multiple layers on an onion. The thing is, nobody should ever have to write this again and again and again. There should be a single library that you code against. You know how Windows developers do it? There's SSPI. That's all they do. SSPI is signature compatible with GSS. So for example, it's probably, you know, getting to the point where I can kind of, I can kind of wrap things up. Um, let's see. All right, I want to stay there. Let me bring up another window. 
field. I'm going to bring up some example code just to give you an idea. Um, CDSVN, users, first name, All right. Okay, this line right here, this is basically, this is, this is all that this app has to do. You can't see that, can you? Um, hold on. Change acknowledgements profile. Is that better? Still can't see with the highlights on there. Can you see that? Yep, yep, okay. Um, so this GSS accept security context is the server side call that basically takes the input buffer that the client sends it and this is all it has to do in order to do authentication. So if you wanted to write an NTLM or a Kerberos enabled application to integrate in with Active Directory, essentially you can link against the, the GSS API Kerberos libraries on the Likewise platform and this just works. Right? So how does this just work? Um, so I have... Over here, let me change the profile again. All right, so I have this negotiate, you know, small server application that, we, that we've implemented. Um, the whole file is 700 lines. Why does it take so long to count? Boo! Yeah. All right. For some reason, I guess I'm running out of swap. The page cache is flushing out. Okay, anyways, trust me, it's only about 700 lines of code. And a lot of it is that is setting up threads, um, setting up the socket, listening on the socket, yada, 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 okay? So what I will do is, I'm just gonna put this in temp to lower my path, and then I'm gonna run this on port 8080, and I'm going to bind to 192.168.56.1. All right, so now this is just running in the background. And caps lock. I'm going to go back to my Windows box. Somebody please fix my Linux box. So I was going to be really slick and I was going to show you how this application integration actually works, but um, oh, there we go. Yeah, I've got some stuff that's sort of paging around. All right, let's see if we can give this a go. So um, I'm logged in as uh, an Active Directory user. I'm logged in as administrator, so Razor slash administrator, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'll just restart this network capture. And then um, bring up Internet Explorer because I haven't configured Firefox. And yeah, that's fine. And I'm going to try to connect to 192.168.56.1 on port 8080. All right. So it prompts me for login credentials, right? And you can see that essentially all the server did is it sent back this HTTP negotiate for the www authenticate header. And so then the client's going to, and it's set, in this case, it's not actually authenticating for SPNego. It's, you can do this with SPNego where it'll use Curb5 or NTLM. This one's actually set up for NTLM testing. So it's at negotiate stage of, uh, of NTLM. So the client's actually going to prompt me for um, credentials. So I'm going to put in um, Razor. G Carter and my password. And it says, Congratulations, GSS API NTLM authentication passed. Over here, um, you know, we see that it's it's gone through some. Da, da, da. Right, so this is actually the base 64 encoding of that GSS API security token that was passed across the wire. Right, and uh, it just decodes that. And then essentially, all it does is it takes that blob and it feeds it into uh, yeah 736 lines okay so gsss accept 
All right, essentially just takes that input buffer, which was wbuff, um, assigns it to the input description with the length and the value, passes it into GSS accept security context. This will just continue as many steps as needed. Um, NTLM actually goes through a couple of passes of this. There's a type one, type two, and type three message. But you just keep calling this until you get GSSS server complete, and you're done. And then you can, you can go through other stages to find information about that particular user. So for example, um, the access token, right, which is the user's list of groups. Um, we will actually pass this back simply if you do a GSS inquire security context. You'll actually get that information back. This could be the pack as it's defined inside the Kerberos ticket, or this could be the um, net user info three structure from the NTLM authentication itself. Um, and then, you know, internally inside the Likewise stack, we're all SID based, um, and we convert to UIDs and GIDs on the boundary when we need to write something to a file or when we need to check a Unix resource. But internally, you know, we're all SID based, so this works out really well. And then the, uh, the security, I don't think I have the security descriptors, but if you've ever dealt with security descriptors, it's essentially just like a, a list of SIDs with 32-bit access masks. So the GSS API interface um, will support going directly to NTLM, which is what we did in that example. Also, it will support SPNAGO as well. Um, these two pieces are actually pulled from the, uh, the MIT code. But this type of GSS interface is, again, SSPI compatible with Windows and supports it's plumbed into essentially all of those protocols, right? So our DCRPC runtime has all of the um, wrap and unwrap, the signing and sealing that's actually, actually implemented in the DSS, uh, the um, uh, DCRPC bind calls by using those same GSS calls. So it's, I mean, I just don't want anybody to ever have to write parsing NTLM packets again. There's just no need for it. Um, you should have a platform, you should be able to build on that platform and you should be able to write your applications and be able to, to leverage work that's, that's already been done. So my time's almost up. Um, I'll make these slides available. They've got a few more details in terms of authentication APIs. Um, the top one's clear text, the bottom one's for doing raw, non-GSS uh, NTLM. Uh, building blocks access tokens. Okay, so if you want uh, the Likewise platform, you can grab it from Git, it's pretty straightforward. We've recently moved to a build system called MakeKit. I cannot sing its praises enough. It cut our build times by over 60%. It has proved that, um, you know, that, that directories and recursive directories is just, you know, harmful to make, okay? What is the name of that paper? My brain's gone into a fart. What is it? Harmful, yeah, it's, it's something like that. I mean, this is like proof for it. And it's a replacement for libtool and autoconf um, and it's really been amazingly fast. So look at the README file. It's pretty straightforward to do. Completely paralyzes the entire build, even across deep directory structures. We do support RPMs and DEBs. The build system's mainly for Linux and FreeBSD at the moment. Um, and then I'm gonna finish up on a soapbox, okay? Um, so this is my soapbox. I was involved in Samba for 11 years, and it was a tremendous um, value to me. I got a lot of really good friends out of it. Um, I did a lot of really interesting work. But my plea to developers is that open source, its greatest strength is also its greatest weakness, okay? Um, it, it's great in that you can continue to work on a project as you move from job to job. You can make a living working on that. However, the advantage of commercial software is that you have to move from project to project. And so my plea to developers in the open source community is to move from project to project because you're smarter than just staying in one place. If you stay in one tight-knit community that doesn't have a, a lot of turnover, you'll start to believe that down is up and up is down. And you'll start to believe that the best practices of that community are the best practices of that industry. So I'm a firm believer in open source. I think it's got tremendous value in so many different ways. But I think that it's very, you have to be very careful that you don't professionally stagnate, okay? So that's one, that's one plea, and this is just personal. Second one is listen to your end users. Without them, you don't have anything to do. And the third thing is to look outward, not inward. Okay, don't become incestuous in the community, but always look outward to see, what's else, see what else is going on. Okay, um, so uh, you know that's the end of the talk. I hope it's been helpful. I'm more than happy to sort of hang around and answer some questions out in the hall. Um, I'll make the slides available both at the conference and if anybody wants them, but uh, I'll leave that one kind of up. So I've got like 30 seconds for questions. So anything before we wrap up? Is everybody's head going to like explode or go to sleep or something? Yeah. Yep. 
Yep. Yes. Yep. You, you mean like a, an RPC service? Yes. Yes. Server and client side. So, so the question was, if you haven't really dealt with this before, but so, so we support name pipes, client and server side. So you can have an RPC application running on a Windows client, accessing server and getting that um, same integrated authentication with an RPC service running on a Linux box, also vice versa as well, okay? Yay! Okay, there was another question. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's probably, so the question was really about likewise enterprise deployment in terms of just coming from a Linux background and is there, is there some white papers? Um, I mean, the thing is, the difficulty in any sort of integration strategy is that you really have to understand both sides of the fence, which is a huge amount to swallow starting off. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, it's, it's probably a question we need to, we should take offline because it's probably more than I can answer right now. So if, I mean, if you're free, I can, we can talk in the hall after this. Okay, what was your name? Dave? Dave? Yeah. Okay, all right. all right. Any other questions? We wrap up before I trip and embarrass myself and end up on YouTube. Okay, thank you all. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. OS, an OS that works the way that you do across all your devices. HP Slate and WebOS. HP.